two, three. All right, hello and welcome to Innovation Celebration. We have the absolute joy of uh, having this podcast live today from the European Resource Bank meeting in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, and Innovation Celebration is a show that is de dedicated to celebrating advances in science and technology, the people and ideas that make them possible, and the ways in which they enhance human flourishing. I am Angelica Walkerworth, and this is my husband, Thomas. And today we're interviewing Matthias Svensson, a Swedish libertarian writer and political commentator, especially writes on health policy and environmental policy, and has released three books, which we have here on the table, and I'm sure you'll be able to tell us a bit more about those. Um, but I first wanted to start by saying that Sweden's one of my favorite countries on earth. It's very prosperous, it's very safe, it's very clean. How did Sweden become such a successful country compared to elsewhere in Europe and the world? Uh, it's it's quite a recent development, actually, uh, and uh, I mean Sweden was not uh, the first country to industrialize, and and uh, even even by the end of the nineteenth century, it was uh, it was quite poor, but especially at the beginning, uh, uh, it was uh, it was corrupt. It was uh, of course not a democracy. It was uh, poor. Uh, and uh, uh, what happens as in many other countries is that uh, during the later part of the 19th century, we got, uh, we got rid of the, uh, uh, we, we got uh, freedom of starting companies. Uh, and uh, you didn't, uh, then, then we had a, a saying that uh, a shoemaker should always be a shoemaker um, and it was quite uh, when, when we started to liberalize this uh, it, 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 there is a uh, there is a painting in Sweden of how uh, how bad it was going to be or, or how ridiculous it was going to be when uh, when the shoemaker were trying to bake and, and the baker were trying to so uh, uh, and uh, everyone would just uh, change uh, their professions and, and then of course nothing would uh, would work uh, but uh, but of course that uh, was not what happened but but you got instead uh, a thorough competition and and people could start out. Uh, you have I've written um, somewhat other subjects, but you can see uh, I've written, for example, on on Sweden's alcohol policy, which is a chapter or rather a book of its own. Uh, but uh, but you can see people from meager backgrounds moving into a city and, and starting uh, importing and selling and, and producing uh, different kinds of of liquor and making a living out of that and. Uh, and, and living in, uh, in in better conditions than they started with, and, and this this starts in in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, Sweden started by selling uh, butter and uh, oats to the rest of the world, uh, and because of that, got a loan so that we could build out our railway system and, and invest in that kind of um, thing. Uh, it was also uh, quite uh, decided by, by great liberal thinkers like uh, Johan August Gripenstedt and, uh, and also Lars Johan Hjerta, which also started the uh, newspaper Aftonbladet, one of the biggest evening newspapers. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he got censored over and over again. And uh, as, as the innovator and entrepreneur he was, uh, he uh, issued new uh, publications, so it was Aftonbladet 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, uh, and eventually he just uh, mocked uh, the authorities so much they realized they, they better leave him, him alone. And of course, that, that was an innovation as well. He got wealthy from it, and, uh, and of course the audience profited, and as with much of uh, things going on in the market economy, what he did was he uh, turned into a broader audience than just uh, the regular elites. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he realized I, if I can sell more copies to more people by pleasing their uh, demands, uh, 
that uh, and and he was critical of course of the powers because that was popular and that was selling uh, and, uh, and and uh, you you cater uh, cater to the plenty uh, and that has been quite uh, with Sweden since then I mean if you look at uh, H&M for example the clothing company or IKEA uh, I mean that these are cheap products for most uh, sold at uh, uh, a small profit per uh, bookshelf or, or what you sell, but uh, but uh, to many, uh, and and that that enriches this, uh, both big parts of society and also, of course, the entrepreneur behind it. So so it's it's the same uh, or a similar story uh, as as with most most countries, but. But there are, I mean, the beauty of this is that every country have uh, made their own way uh, through uh, to, to prosperity. And, and uh, they are similar in some ways, but, uh, but they also uh, build on individual flourishing and, and national character and so on. Certainly, yes. It sounds like you had liberalization allowed for innovation and competition and entrepreneurship, which are common things. But then, as you point out, the particular um, interests of the people involved in the Swedish character sort of lent its own flavor to it, which is lovely. Um, Going to sort of turn us a little bit uh, in the conversation. You've written on environmental policy and environmental concerns. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how certain innovations and in technology um, will help deal with such environmental concerns as are legitimate. I know you have a few specific examples you can you can share with us on this. Uh, yeah, um, the thing is, uh, much of what has happened uh, can can be illustrated in 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 the story of one Swedish company called the Rönnskärsverken, a smelter in in northern Sweden that uh, uh, that takes uh, processes uh, from the mines and, and makes metals. Mm. Um, it, this was started in the in 1930 uh, and we got uh, immediately got got to be Sweden's largest emitter uh, no problems because we have built the highest smokestack <laughs> in, in all of Europe 145 meters because that was the wisdom of the day uh, if if the smokestack stack is high enough or uh, the plumbing is long enough, you can keep your problems away from you. Out of sight, out of mind. Right? Yes, yes, yes. And and uh, I mean, it, uh, it, uh, of course, I mean, it, uh, they realized uh, emissions uh, create local problems, uh, but the conception of uh, that, that environmental problems, uh, that, that emission could travel, for example, over national borders. Mm -hmm. That's an insight not really taking place until 1970s, 1980s, much later. Uh, so this was uh, the, uh, uh, the wisdom of the day. And uh, in 1933, uh, they emitted uh, as most, uh, that was most, most of the sulfur, uh, 180,000 tons per year. Uh, and uh, they, 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 of course, was uh, Sweden's uh, largest emitter by then. Uh, and that is also a thing to, I mean, you, you tend to reason that, oh, all the emissions are increasing and increasing and increasing. Most of them are not. And, and sulfur is just one of, of the biggest examples of that. Uh, the peak was in 1933. And what happened then was um, they realized these are quite potent chemicals <laughs> were just letting out in the air. Um, why not make chemicals of it and sell it to the chemical industry? So, so sulfur, uh, sulfur, sulfuric acid and, and uh, other components were made out of the smokes. Uh, as, uh, they, they were rest products that you got commercial use of. And in that way, could make a saleable product. And I mean, that, that's how most fuels and everything has, has taken, uh, has started to, to be used. I mean, uh, when, when you were, uh, I, I forget the name for what you, what you fired uh, lamps with before, 
paraffin. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I mean, uh, gas was was a rest product that you, you just <laughs> uh, spilled out uh, in in the beginning, and then you made something of it. And, and this, in this case, you also decreased uh, the emissions quite a lot. Uh, then you go to around circa 1970, uh, and then you get some. Uh, we got this uh, authority and and uh, a politics for. Uh, for emissions, uh, and, uh, and and you realize uh, uh, then uh, the emission of sulfur is around seventy thousand uh, tons a year. So I mean it's more than half since since the beginning, but it's still quite a lot. Uh, and uh, they also start diving and measuring, and, and they uh, they realize that uh, the bottom of the sea is totally dead kilometers around here. I mean, why? Well, it might be the 2000 tons of arsenic you put in the water every year. Uh, and also uh, thousands or hundreds of tons of, of heavy metals of different kinds and so on. Uh, and, and so there was, uh, there was uh, a, a real uh, cause for concern from authorities. And, and then it was like the company said, uh, the the authorities said, "Well, uh, you you can't really proceed like this." And, and the company said, "Well, we hear you, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it's it would be too expensive to to clean this up." Uh, and then started a bit of regulation, a bit of taxation of uh, of uh, uh, emissions, uh, regulating these kind of quite hazardous and. Uh, 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 emissions uh, and also the thing that shows when you, when you started this as uh, as has been noted in other countries is that uh, companies uh, the costs are usually not that high that you expected uh, it's it's uh, in a way the antithesis is to to infrastructure project uh, that are always more expensive than than you project uh, environmental uh, reducing emissions are usually cheaper than expected uh, and that is because uh, in incremental innovation uh, in a way and that uh, has taken place until uh, the be in the beginning of the 2000s uh, uh, while producing more uh, are emitting three to four thousand tons of sulfur uh, Still, Sweden's highest highest emitter, so so they're not atypical in this. From one hundred and eighty thousand to three to four thousand, uh, and other uh, the heavy metals are, are down to uh, some tons a year uh, in, instead of uh, hundreds or thousands. So it's been an enormous progress, but unnoticed since it's, it takes place over time gradually, incrementally, some of it due to regulation, but to follow regulation, you still have to innovate mm -hmm. uh, and keep competitive. And that is another thing with uh, Sweden is a small country. You, you can't really produce only for the Swedish market. So most of our big, uh, all of our big companies and, and most of our companies also uh, in the rural areas, uh, I mean, in uh, there's been a lot of talk in in the United States about, uh, about uh, the, the losers from globalization. If you go out in, in Swedish rural areas, you will probably find some of the winners of globalization, a specialized small company that has quite a large niche of the world market for their specialized product. Uh, because have, if, if you have to pay, pay Swedish salaries, uh, you have to be really good at what you do uh, and, and be quite technically advanced. Uh, but but all, all, all over the country, there are companies living up to that. Uh, and, and so Ron uh, Kjersvägen illustrates that uh, innovation, some regulation that, that is not out to kill uh, uh, the, uh, what you actually do and produce, uh, but lets you produce that uh, with the smallest amount of emission and, uh, and incremental, incremental development where you produce more but emit less. Uh, and, and that was doable in this case. And this is, of course, the, 
uh, the transmission you want to accomplish with environmental policy and help along with environmental policy? Yeah, it, it, there's a different, difficult question in terms of the role of government here, because so from our, as, from our point of view, the role of government is very much to protect people's rights. And, um, and you, you know, as far as the environmental debates concerned, there tend to be two camps. One is, you know, because of climate change, we must regulate everything and, you know, achieve net zero and massively constrain human flourishing in the process, stop people from flying, all that kind of stuff. And on the other hand, there's just outright denial of climate change is not real and there's nothing in between and what I would like to see is the government keeping to its role of protecting rights and things like arsenic in the water supply or sulfur in the air that affects people's ability to live their lives or fish or you know carry out their business those are situations where pollution has a real impact on people's lives and there is there is a role potentially for government to make sure that people aren't violating each other's rights in, in what they put in the air and in the water um, but then staying out of the way of innovation, letting us continue to live because human life going on and flourishing should always be the goal at the end of the day. Yes, and, and that is also the way of, uh, of handling. I mean, I mean uh, by far uh, the, the most deadly environmental problem is still in, indoor uh, air. Uh, when, when people have to make a fire inside, I mean, that that kills around, I, I think it's about 3.5, 3.8 million a year, uh, mostly women and children. Uh, and that is because of poverty. Uh, I mean, I mean, any industrialization, no matter how dirty, is, is a step toward uh, a, a better environment for, for those human beings. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you can take those steps uh, as efficiently as possible with, uh, with the cleanest the technology as possible uh, that that is uh, that is for the benefit uh, of all and, and you should have respect for for people's uh, will to live uh, I, I mean have the same development as, as our countries have uh, have experienced uh, and, and that means uh, have, uh, having a dynamic economy that can adapt that experiments that are uh, that are all the time doing this, and, and the market economy uh, is, is vital to this. I mean, the most dramatic decrease in emissions uh, are, are, are made from uh, the pricing system because resources cost. Uh, throwing things away is a cost, uh, and uh, at, at least an alternative cost. So these, uh, these kinds of things are always with the entrepreneurs. And, and sometimes it can help uh, to think of, um, of the environment as well. When Walmart was looking into, uh, oh, what can we do for the climate? They realized that, uh, well, we can save a lot of money from, uh, from adapting temperatures in our warehouses and so on. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they consumed less fuel, had lower costs, uh, and were doing things that were good for uh, for, for both profits and environment. Of course, it's not always that simple. I think you, you as well need to price emissions and you should realize that it's always, it's always kind of a, a, a trade-off. But I think uh, the rule of thumb that you can use is that you expect progress in the economy. You expect the same progress uh, in the environment. Uh, you expect more over time uh, and that can be consumed uh, as, uh, as uh, economic growth, which, which of course you can't plan that, oh, we should have exactly that, <laughs> even though uh, uh, politicians try to pretend. And, and of course you can pr uh, pretend that we should have that exactly pattern of emission reductions. Usually you don't, but over time you get, uh, you get development even here with uh, known regulation as uh, some bans, but mostly pricing of, uh, of emissions. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm gonna take us on another handbrake tour. Um, one of the other topics you write a lot about is health policy. Um, specifically, you mentioned your history of um, alcohol policy in Sweden, but some other topics as well. 
Starting out fairly broadly, which policies would you say when it comes to health are encouraging innovation in this absolutely vital field for human flourishing? And which policies have you seen to be the most, um, most of a hindrance to innovation? Yeah, what, what we see here is, uh, is more, I mean, uh, I, I write a lot about uh, paternalism, nanny state regulations. So you mostly get demonstration by, by the opposite. I mean, this is, this is usually the measure uh, to, to make people healthy, uh, but you don't work with people. But but uh, but but try to override their decisions because you don't think that ordinary people can make decisions uh, make the decisions for themselves. Uh, and uh, what uh, what I've realized over and over again with these regulations is how counterproductive they are, uh, and and how much that can flourish even in these areas because people tend to not want to be dependent on substances. People tell, tend to value, if you ask people what, what are their uh, concerns, uh, I mean, health comes really high up there. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we always uh, make uh, decisions with our longer term health uh, as, as a main focus and, and good riddance, what, what a boring life that would be. Uh, but but we still have a lot of interest in that 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 shows in uh, usually in in what happens when you have restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, so so there are a lot of examples where, uh, when <laughs> one, one thing is that uh, in in Sweden uh, in the end of the uh, 19th century we started uh, a regulation that. Uh, it, it was uh, for the working men, of course, because the middle classes and the better educated, of course, could handle themselves. But, but they, uh, they were uh, concerned politicians of, of uh, those day elites. They thought about the working class and they wanted the working class to have nice restaurants to go to where they uh, would eat uh, properly and not drink as much. So what do you do? Uh, of course, you make it mandatory uh, to order a meal if you want to drink and, and you should uh, you should have uh, a limit on how much drink is served and and for for the purpose of administering it's most easy if you only serve booze which is for sweden uh, mostly did um, and and so you could have three shots uh, as a male half as female uh, and you had to order a meal uh, so then People, of course, would eat and not drink. Uh, and, and that is what happened in the rural areas, because then you would go to the only place, you would order a meal, uh, drink your shots, and then go home. But, the, but then there was, you, you might realize what happened in, in bigger areas. They realized that there's kind of a kind of lot of drunkenness uh, here. What, what's going on? And, and a former policeman who was now working for the for the government uh, the, the 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 city uh with with serving uh he started uh, is 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 the is the personnel is uh, do they they serve too much uh, but he checked them no they're not uh so so what's going on here uh, and he realized uh, that people when Went out, went to one place, ordered uh, the mandatory dinner, which of course was the cheapest one on the menu. That was called uh, a lot of uh, names, uh, <laughs> and uh, and then you got your three shots, uh, and then they didn't go home. Uh, they went to the next place, ordered the mandatory uh, deal. So in in one. Uh, uh, in, in Gothenburg, uh, they arrested a man uh, with uh, ten boiled eggs in his <laughs> in his suit. Uh, that was, of course, a mandatory food from ten. <laughs> so he was drunk as an egg, um, and, uh, and 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 then uh, that that's where uh, the term bar round uh, came from in in Sweden because because you made a bar. Uh, one, one interesting thing is what happened with, uh, I mean, uh, what, what were the motives for, uh, for the restaurants? Usually uh, they, they were socialized uh, for serving the working class. Uh, 
but but still uh, money in uh, serves some purpose. What happened? I mean, those serving the edible food were, of course, the restaurant uh, that people went to first, where they actually ate the food. Uh, the other, uh, they put in uh, the food and then they put it out again. They could use the same uh, food serving a lot of, and, and this got ritualized over time. So uh, sometimes people to stop this put uh, a cigarette butt in, in, in the food, but not even that stopped people. from. So you had to be really careful if you were ordering the cheapest stuff on the menu, uh, you had to really make clear that I intend to eat this <laughs> if, if you were about, and, and there are stories all over uh, Sweden about uh, shocked personnel and oh no oh, oh, you were supposed to eat that well let me um, so so uh, you earned more from serving worse food uh, and that was the economy of it and no what what, what uh, these restrictions over the years uh, made of Sweden because we didn't ban but we heavily regulated uh, we imposed this system until 1955 in all of Sweden uh, and uh, what happened was the total death of uh, eating culture in, in Sweden because if you if you were desperate enough to go out it had to be for the liquor <laughs> uh, so so you accomplished by regulating uh, the exact opposite of, of what you can, uh, what you wanted to accomplish. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the sugar taxes that have come in in Britain recently, and um, they've had two main consequences. The idea, the government's you know moronic idea, was that if they tax sugary drinks like you know sodas, uh, people will drink them less. And instead, what happens is poor people spend more money on sugary drinks, or drinks companies put aspartame and other sweeteners in their drinks instead of sugar, which is really less healthy so that the, you, know, you either end up making people poorer or making them less healthy than they were before yeah. sugar is another great example <laughs> uh, actually we have uh, it, it shows the the effect of, of taxes and it's one of my favorite examples you we have smuggling to denmark uh, because denmark has quite high sugar taxes uh, so so we have regular smuggling of, of candy uh, and, and illegal candy sellers in uh, in, in Denmark <laughs> selling uh, selling candy uh, that that are non taxed and of course people buy it on travel as in Sweden. I mean, uh, one one other thing in Swedish culture is uh, a whole the whole premise of uh, one of the most popular film films in the 1980s, Selskaps Resan. It's people going to uh, Gran Canaria in, in, in Spain. Uh, and it's not only for the sun in the Swedish winter, but also for the alcohol you could buy. Uh, because uh, if you could buy one liter of liquor, and if you got to a special place, uh, you could also bring a bottle of wine. <laughs> but if you got liquor uh, in a bottle of wine, you could bring two liters and, and, and two, two of the guys that are also into drinking everything tax free so that the, the travel will pay for itself. Uh, they, they are also on the hunt for this place where they plump uh, liquor into wine bottles uh, so that you could get two liters in Sweden instead of one. The, um, the smuggling into Denmark actually leads us quite nicely onto our next question, which is you know, going outside of health policy, just innovation generally and entrepreneurship generally. Um, how much are borders, international borders, a barrier to innovation and economic growth? And how much does free movement of people and goods help? I mean, for, for a small country like Sweden, I mean, uh, as, as I was into before, I mean, the world is our market. Uh, and and uh, you can't uh, you can't make a, a serious product without having the market mainly outside Sweden and and that uh, that means you have to cater to uh, to populations uh, and, and so on that that makes for what uh, the economist Ruchir Sharma calls 
good billionaires instead of bad billionaires. The bad billionaires are the one with political clout and, and usually in, in, in the uh, extracting industries, uh, classical example. Uh, but, but most of Sweden's billionaires are, are the kind that cater to audiences outside of, of Sweden and, and mainly outside uh, political clout. So sort of real capitalists rather than cronies. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so, and so, of course, I mean, uh, the ability to move is, 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 of course, vital for finding those markets and also finding uh, all, all the inputs, uh, mm -hmm. because it's go, it, it definitely goes both ways. Uh, and, and also for all kinds of, I mean, experiences, uh, experiencing something unusual, picking up ideas, uh, studying and, and, and every, everything like that, of course, that's that's vital. Yeah. So relatedly, uh, when we're talking about innovation and entrepreneurship, um, can you tell us about the free speech scene in Sweden, what, that, what that's been like, and a little bit about, I think it's fairly obvious, hopefully, that you need free speech for innovation, but it gets a little bit gray, I think, to some people when you're talking about, well, what about research in particular areas that some people find objectionable? And things like that and i think that's where it gets really tricky when it comes to innovation so can you just talk about what the situation is regarding that um, here in sweden yeah it's it, it's a bit um uh we're a bit like uh i mean much of that it is regulated in europe these mm. days and uh, so for example uh, genetically modified products have not made uh, headway in swedish that's that's not really uh, a debate issue uh, in, in I, I mean you you it's not that there's a ban on what you can say on on uh, on on, uh, on uh, what's good with uh, genetically modified uh, plants but uh, since it's not uh, demonstrated it's not a big issue uh, unfortunately uh, and uh, and this is, I, I think that is the case rather than, than you can't introduce different, uh, different top, topics. And then of course, Sweden is, is much of a uh, consensus culture where, where it's, uh, I mean, it, it's not uh, that, that you regulate, but that you have this deplatforming or, or we don't have these many arenas for, uh, for speech. So, so that uh, it, it, it's easy to be beside the mainstream uh, and, and that is usually how uh, how voices are not uh, are not listened to. Some of these voices are definitely being listened to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the <laughs> students celebrating uh, for the first time in a few years. <laughs> I think we should welcome it. Cool. Um, awesome. So yeah. So our last sort of main question on our list is um, specifically drug policy and how um, restrictions on all of them. Wait, one, one, one thing about, I mean, uh, there's also the commercial speech uh, and, and being able to make your product known. Yeah. Uh, and and that, of, that has, uh, I mean, if, if you're familiar with uh, a Swedish liquor brand, that's pro probably Absolute Vodka. Yeah. Uh, and that was actually brought forward by a state monopoly on, uh, on all liquor, uh, which has a long history, but they realized uh, they could only say, sell to the retail monopoly in Sweden. And things were turning sour because the retail monopoly uh, were into selling wine, uh, because uh, wine is middle class and, and it's more uh, proper and regular than, than selling booze, uh, and, and you get to travel to France to buy it, and that's nice. Uh, so, uh, so the two state monopolies were in kind of a clash. Uh, so what do they, well, if you can't sell to our only customer in Sweden, we should sell it abroad. And they developed this, uh, and, and what can we do uh, in, in the same year they decided to, to go along with this, uh, advertising for liquor was banned in Sweden, but the mother of all commercial campaigns sold hard liquor in the rest of the world. 
uh, bringing money to to uh, the state monopoly, uh, and that is how one of, one of the big uh, business successes uh, still is uh, a big business success in 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 Sweden. Uh, so uh, uh, so that that tells you the the value of uh, of being able to to be heard commercially because nowadays. When you have, uh, for example, uh, we have an explosion of whiskey producers and so on, and they want to find uh, a market abroad as well, they have to, under under the European standardization, they have to uh, follow the stricter Swedish rules on commercial. So, so they have trouble uh, communicating uh, their their products with uh, uh, with with buyers and, and customers abroad. Uh, and, and that's of course okay. Uh, that's liquor. You 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 gonna uh, find it anyway. But but it it shows that um, the value of being able to communicate that we have a new product. Uh, I mean, it's fun. It's uh, it, it's uh, it, it makes uh, for our care for for small differences that make make life more enjoyable and then more more to choose from. Uh, but it's also, I mean, it's uh, it's vital for for company success and, and uh, the ability of, of of growing. Just a quick clarification question on that: When you say that um, it was a state monopoly on liquor, was it a company, a private company, that was being granted special privileges, or was it a state-owned enterprise? Uh, it was kind of both. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a fantastic history. It's uh, it's why I've written a whole book on alcohol policy. It was one person, uh, Ivan Bratt, who was uh, a politician, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, and uh, a doctor, uh, and uh, a social activist, all at once. Uh, he got control of uh, the retail monopoly in Stockholm, uh, and. Uh, Gradually, uh, during uh, the First World War, when most people had other things to think about, uh, he went around uh, to all the uh, producers saying, well, it would be tough if no one bought from you. Uh, do you want to sell to me? <laughs> he gave them an offer he cannot refuse. And, and that created uh, a, a company kind, kind of a, in a legal void. Uh, so, so the whole Swedish system was was created by by an entrepreneur, uh, not really under the laws or anything, but but with great uh, great, great ability to uh, to move, which has caused several corruption scandals as well. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I like uh, Ayn Rand's idea of you know we we have this principle of separation of church and state, and there should be a separation of economics and state. Christian. Yeah, yeah, and and I definitely believe in the separation of drugs and state because <laughs> yeah. the, the state can't handle it. Yeah, so that was my last question. Really, our last question was um, restrictions on drugs. Obviously, you know, if somebody wants to get high for the fun of it, that's really none of the state's business. But moreover, restricting drug research like cannabis research and things like that has a lot of consequences in slowing down developments of cures, treatments, medical developments as well. So do you, um, I know you've been to a couple of cannabis conferences and things like that. Do you have any insights on, on what we're missing out potentially because of that regulation? I, I don't, the, the thing is you don't know. Uh, and and, and, and the, the potentials are huge. I mean, there's, uh, there's the, uh, a, a book from uh, a recent book on on Swedish psychedelic history uh, from uh, from one of the uh, lefty author that, uh, that that I just read and it has been quite dead for fifty years even though uh, many of of the research pro uh, uh, areas were, were quite promising. Uh, and, and we see a recent, recent restart uh, in in the uh, uh, development. Then we also have this. Uh, uh, I mean, we have great barriers to new innovations, and that is one of the reasons that this is not researched on because because you cannot make a lot of money from it uh, mm -hmm. because because it's products already existing, so you can't patent it uh, and. 
we've created a system of patents and controls uh, that make it so uh, expensive to develop new products. Uh, and, and it also creates a pattern for what we regard as, as, as medicine and as uh, treatment. That, that is, uh, it, it works fine. But this shows that there are other areas, there are things that should be researched on uh, that, that could potentially lead to cheaper and better treatments that we don't get with this extremely regulated and ex extremely uh, making it expensive uh, system that we have today. Uh, and uh, and, and that, that, that is a call for, for a simpler uh, rules uh, and, and uh, maybe, may, maybe not the same patent system because uh, I mean I, I believe it of course uh, in uh, that, that, you, that you should make money from, from an innovation and so on have some kind of first serve but uh, the exact amount of how much that should be and how many years and so on uh, that has been gradually and gradually expanded uh, in the interest of companies, but not uh, the consumers, I think. So that, that has been uh, a, a good idea has been kidnapped and, uh, and, and become more crony than, than capitalism in later years. And I think uh, that not more happening in, uh, in, in the medical potential of, of uh, these kind of drugs is, is one example of what, what could be uh, what could be developed, but what has it. Yeah, yeah. If if um, if there were if people were getting their you know entertainment drugs from companies rather than from criminals, then you know some of that funding would probably find its way back into research and. Mm. Oh, oh yes, oh yes, uh, and, and and also you should you should work with people on this. And we have uh, another example of this is uh, what's called snus oral tobacco uh, is very big in Sweden. So we have the lowest rate of smokers anywhere in, uh, in uh, the developed world. Uh, and we have a quite unique, a unique pattern of this because uh, at, at least a couple, of, a couple of years ago, uh, we are the only one, uh, only country with uh, lower uh, male smoking, uh, smokers, uh, lower share of male smokers than female smokers. Uh, and that is because oral tobacco is mostly used by men. Uh, so this has most people stop smoking, just stop smoking. Uh, some are helped by, uh, by uh, medical, uh, but some are also helped by going over to oral tobacco, which gives them kicks, uh, but not uh, the same health risk not by far the same health risk at, at smoking every day. No one says it's, it's, it's your, your perfect health kick, but, but I mean, people want their stimulants. Uh, and if you work to give them easier stimulants, I mean, and, and uh, of, of course, uh, give the commercial flavor that, that, you could, yeah, that you could spread this instead, that is usually the lesser both the lesser evil, but also more fun. Yeah, it's like when we in landscape architecture, you talk about desire lines or in urban planning. It's where people are going to walk anyway. They're going to walk across that nice square of grass you just put there. So make the path there anyway. Yeah. It's where they're yeah. going to go. Yeah, people will always do what people want. <laughs> yes. yeah. So I think that's. I think that wraps up our yeah. questions. Do you have any final comments on innovation or entrepreneurship before we open it up to see if our lovely audience has any questions? <laughs> Oh, there's there's so much to say, but I, I, you you had quite a few uh, questions, so I think uh, we covered a lot. We did indeed. Oh, oh thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And and we have some folks joining us today. Any do any of you have any questions? Um, primarily for Matthias, but we can ask, answer questions as well. No, we, we, can, we can, cleared everything. We can we can stop the live stream and say thank you very much once more. All right. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for uh, tuning in to Innovation Celebration. Thank you. All right.